Welcome to Alaska Edition, a weekly public affairs program produced by Alaska Public Media in the studios of KAKM. Hello and welcome to Alaska Edition. I'm your host, Zachariah Hughes, and today we are talking all about Juno. The legislative session started this week and we're already seeing battles brew over the budget as well as a raft of pre-filed bills ranging wildly in feasibility and relevance. To discuss what's ahead this session and how it stacks up to years past, I am lucky to be joined by two, uh, two, uh, two journalists with years of experience covering the legislator, legislature. John Arano runs the news site Alaska Commons and uh, has been keeping a close eye on the state's financial situation as it's hashed out in Juneau. And Rich Maurer is an editor at the Alaska Dispatch News and a longtime political reporter. So Rich, just starting out right off the bat, how does this session compare to past ones in terms of the focus? Well, it seems like this year, uh, every year there's always something, some big thing, uh, whether it's gas line or oil taxes. Uh, but this year, there's an overwhelming thing, and that's the budget and the, fis the, the so-called fiscal plan, uh, which hopefully will resolve some of the issues of the, of, uh, of the huge deficit that Alaska is facing. And uh, it's going to dominate and over perhaps overwhelm this session. And so, John, what are the moving parts in that regard? I mean, between the governor's plan, the mm -hmm. legislature's proposal, uh, just different things that are being discussed? Sure. So this week, uh, the budget proposal offered by the Walker administration was introduced to the House and Senate Finance Committees. Uh, it's basically showing what we're dealing with, which is the third straight year of a $3.5 billion deficit or more, that's still an open question, and an operating budget of $5, five billion. Uh, what Walker is proposing, uh, what Governor Walker is proposing, is a one-time uh, payout of three billion from the Constitutional Budget Reserve. Uh, also, across the board, kind of what I would refer to as nickel and diming taxes, uh, alcohol tax, tobacco tax, um, and then a uh, basically reinstating a six percent income tax, uh, which. Rich, you'd know better than me, but that went away in the 80s, I think? It was before, before my time, that. too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> went um, away in 1980. Gotcha. And this comes after last year, you know, we, we started to see the, the price of oil dip. Now it's, you know, our, our budgets, even, even the budget that we're dealing with now is based on uh, $56 a barrel oil. Uh, I think it just ticked a smidge up over $30 a barrel today. So uh, there was a fun article about how the actual steel drums uh, that we store the oil in are $100. They're, the actual barrels are more uh, valuable right now than the oil that, that, how, that is housed in them. So that is our, our, our budget proposal. And, and it's, there's also major changes in terms of the uh, permanent fund dividend, where as of now, we all receive our nice uh, dividend checks from the earnings uh, of the permanent fund. Walker is proposing that we instead use the earnings uh, to fund government and instead use the, and, and also the production tax to fund government and use uh, the oil, oil and gas royalties to pay out our dividend, which uh, best case scenario cuts the checks in half. Uh, for the average Alaskan. And I want to I want to talk about some of the pol political feasibility behind some of those mm -hmm. proposals but before we do we have a video that I want to show it's from our uh, Cracker Jack video team trying to represent the budget as a lunch. Um, it was described to me as energy by energy reporter Rachel Waldholtz as uh, imagining the budget as a sandwich and um, that's really all I feel I need to say about it so <laughs> let's show that. Say the state budget is your lunch. There's a lot there. About two and a half billion dollars comes from the federal government. That money's earmarked for specific things, so let's set it aside. What's left is the general fund. That's what the governor and lawmakers have to come up with each year. Over the last decade, most of that has come from oil revenue. As recently as a couple years ago, that worked pretty well. Oil prices were really high. But since then, prices have plummeted and oil production is down too. Now, lawmakers have to figure out how to make the state's lunch with a lot less in the fridge. Option one, cut spending. There are a few things that make up the bulk of the budget. The biggest chunk is education. Next is health and social services. More than half of this is Medicaid. Number three, refundable oil tax credits. These go mostly to smaller companies, many of them in Cook Inlet. Then there's the University of Alaska and the Department of Corrections. And the Department of Transportation. Well, what if we just got rid of the ferries? 
You hear about a lot of other things, like the legislature's expensive office space in Anchorage, or per diem for lawmakers and staff. What if we just cut the whole legislature? And while we're at it, the governor's office. That still leaves a billion dollars in the budget. Option two, raise revenue. That means taxes. Right now, the state expects to take in just over a billion dollars in oil revenue and half a billion dollars in all other taxes. What if we double the minimum tax on oil companies? Governor Bill Walker has proposed the first income tax since 1980. Some lawmakers have said they'd like a sales tax better. Call it a 3% sales tax. The governor has also proposed raising taxes on fishing, mining, tourism, and motor fuel. Also alcohol and tobacco. And there's always that marijuana tax. And all of that only gets us halfway there. Option three, raid the cookie jar. The state has two main savings accounts. There's the Constitutional Budget Reserve. That's the state's rainy day fund. Then there's the Permanent Fund. You can't touch the principal, but you can use the earnings. Here's the catch. A big chunk of those earnings go to the Permanent Fund dividend. So if you use the earnings, you reduce the dividend. In the end, the state will have to decide on some combination of cuts, taxes, and savings. Otherwise, the deficit is going to eat our lunch. Rich, regardless of how you feel about cookies, as, yeah, the cookies <laughs> as a, a part of the lunch, uh, I do want to ask um, what mm -hmm. some of the calculus that lawmakers are working with as far as weighing those options, cuts versus uh, rating the cookie jar, you know? Well, I think the, probably the most interesting thing that's happened in the last three or four months is that uh, that legislators came at this thing in the summer, the spring, saying, "Cuts, we got to cut, we got to cut state government," and people would ask them, uh, "If we're doing our job as journalists, we're asking them, well, where?" And 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 that's sort of where there was some stumbling. Well, you know, you could say. Well, me cut Medicaid, you know, okay, where, cut what in Medicaid? Uh, you know, cut, cut education. Well, what, what are you going to cut in education? And eventually you got to where uh, it became very hard to say cut because, um, because I mean, it's, it's, it, as they say, you could fire every state employee and you still have a, a, you know, more than a billion dollars in deficits. So, um, so how how do you how do you get there? And that seems to be the biggest the biggest the biggest issue is that you need you need something big. You know, you, you talked about the nickel and dime taxes, the pot tax, the alcohol tax, those you know, mining. Um, those are pretty small. They're they're gonna they're gonna you know do a little bit. Even the income tax is not going to solve the problem. The only thing that the only big pot of money that we have. Are the earnings from the Alaska Permanent Fund, and 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 I think people are realizing now in making that calculus that that's all they got. And when S and P downgraded Alaska's credit from AAA mm -hmm. to AA uh, mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago, AA plus, I, that, yeah, AA plus. So that w I never got a AA mm -hmm. plus, so that's a, a foreign <laughs> grade to me. But uh, that was part of the explanation, right? Was mm -hmm. that we there, the money exists, but mm -hmm. this is a political problem. Is that, uh, that yeah, accurate? yeah, and and I don't think AA plus is you know I, I think. Probably Michigan would would love to have a double A plus. Um, so it's not like we're it's not like we're crying, uh, but that is that is that sure that says that says it all that um, that we're not we're not sitting fat completely, but we're not we're not we're not really hurting mm -hmm. yet. And and John, how the governor's plan that kind of has come out before all other steps? How's that been greeted in the legislature? Well, first off, uh, our fiscal crisis looked delicious. Um, I, you know, <laughs> uh, it's been received probably how you would expect it to be. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a, kind of a jagged ideological divide uh, in the legislature. Um, the minority caucus or the Democratic Independent Coalition uh, is very concerned about how an income tax would uh, neg negatively hurt um, lower income people. It's better than a sales tax, for instance, which predominantly hurts, you know, the lower the income, the, the worse the sales tax uh, can be. Uh, but they're also concerned about the effect of, or the changes to the PFD, where you have a lot of people in Alaska who are entirely dependent on the PFD to fund their lives for the year. 
Uh, on the right side of the aisle, the, the majority caucus uh, is really sticking to their guns in terms of we just need to cut more. We need to cut more, we need to cut more, we need to cut more. I thought Governor Walker was pretty clear in his State of the State speech last night and Legislative Finance Director David Teal, who's been uh, sacrificed on the altar in the in the different uh, finance committees, you know, presenting the budget. Uh, they're all saying what what Richard was asserting, which is you can cut everything. You can cut every state employees beyond the hundreds that were let go of last year, and it doesn't make a dent. You mentioned David Teal, and actually, mm -hmm. I want to pull a quote up here that we have now. Um, Rich, it's from one of your reporters, Nat mm -hmm. Hers, who wrote mm -hmm. earlier in the week that. Um, you know, after Teal made this bleak budget forecast, uh, he's the state's budget advisor, I should say. Um, and what Nat wrote was that many have been critical of Walker's proposal, but Teal's report offers lawmakers political cover to give more serious consideration to com uncomfortable measures like taxes or smaller dividends. Um, explain why lawmakers need cover on those issues. Uh, well, uh, because they're looking to the left and they're looking to their right, and uh, and and Teal, who works for the Teal, works for the legislature. I mean, he works for the Republicans. He works for the Democrats. Uh, and uh, and if you're if you're kind of in that middle somewhere, and you say, well, uh, I don't, um, I'm concerned because the voters will will hit me over the head if I take away some of the permanent fund checks. Or they hit me over the head if I if I say let's let's tax them somehow. Um, he he's one more voice of which there are many many voices saying we really reached the end of the line. You have to do these things. You have to do income tax or some kind of tax. You have to do permanent fund uh, earnings. And uh, and and he's you know he's he is another one of these these guys who've been there forever and is saying that. And John, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, um, Craig Tutin, who's one of our other reporters, has been, he's basically camped in the uh, finance committees, or at least watching uh, on the gavel. Um, and it, as Richard said, like, Teal's been straight up front and just saying, we are burning through our reserves. Uh, we need to do something. There, there is no other option. We can't just rely on cuts. Uh, he referenced the Rasmussen poll uh, that was recently released which shows that everybody wants cuts and new revenues. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows, just like lawmakers have that same predicament, uh, they don't know where to cut. Everybody just kind of goes, well, we'll cut administration because nobody knows what that really means. Um, and the problem is lawmakers don't have as much cover as I think they would like to have because the poll also showed that, uh, A, the public doesn't understand how much we already cut, the 500 million in cuts that we uh, put through last year. And they also don't know what is in Governor Walker's plan. Um, it's, it's kind of a win-lose in terms of this probably should have been something that we addressed in, in session last year. Um, but at the same time, uh, we would have based it off of uh, inflated oil prices, you know, which have dropped further down. But unfortunately, we kind of took away their cover in terms of we're headed into uh, an election year and a presidential election year where the most people vote. And the poll, which I think was meant to offer cover to them, didn't really show that. You know, a lot of these people aren't going to understand what the plan really is until it shows up on their, uh, you know, opponent's campaign literature on their mm -hmm. on their doorknob. Mm -hmm. And Rich, did you have one yeah, more thing? Yeah, we, we call them lawmakers now. They're mm -hmm. lawmakers January, right. February, March, right. and eight, part of April. And then the rest of the time, they're elected officials. They're running for office to become, to remain a lawmaker or to become a lawmaker. And in running for office, they have to look. What are the? You know, it, it's it's a lot of fun to be a legislator when there's a ton of money and you can give money away to this person and that person. You can build roads and and schools and all this other stuff. And it's not a lot of fun in this type of environment. And they have to convince the people who would vote for them that I did the best I could. And that's probably going to mean I did the best I could, and and now I'm taking away some of your check. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, Governor Walker's speech last night. I, I saw a tweet from one reporter in Fairbanks that said, "Okay, the short version mm -hmm. of this is uh, I don't mind being a one-term governor as long as I do what's right mm -hmm. now." And mm -hmm. it, it, it's interesting that Walker seems to be sort of raising the specter of politics in some of the budget d debates. Um, on that, we have another video queued up that I want to show. It's from a group uh, called Our Alaska. The video came out. There was some coverage, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Rich, with you guys um, earlier in the week and some other places. And um, 
It's a crowdfunding campaign to try and engage more young people in the budget discussion uh, with a kind of comedic take on an issue that I think we can all agree is kind of dry. So uh, why don't we show a clip from that? So why are we doing this instead of this? Because we want this. Oh, this economy is just so stable. It is glorious. Instead of this. Oh, my. Oh, everything is not glorious. So, if you share our vision for a more stable economy, and you want to help do something about it, come join our group, or just give us your money. John, they're aiming for $10,000 to expand a campaign made up of stuff like this, mm -hmm. videos and engaging people. The premise to all that, though, is that uh, young people have a arguably greater stake in uh, budget security and financial security than lawmakers or the governor, older folks, um, but are less engaged. Do you buy that premise? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, it, budgets, as was stated earlier, are, are very dry. They're really complicated. You know, I, as, as journalists, it's, it's a lot of hours trying to figure out what this means and wh where this is coming from and whether which, this... Which part of the sandwich uh, yeah, can you do with that? You know, younger voters, um, and this could be changing just because economics are coming to the forefront, you know, both in state and national and world politics, uh, but younger voters generally are more responsive to social issues. And uh, there's, there's not a lot of social issues in, in budgets, uh, you know, people can argue it's a moral document, and I, I would subscribe to that theory, but it's hard to uh, engage younger voters and older voters, frankly, <laughs> in, in budgets because it's not a one step process. You know, it's not do I support marriage equality, it's not do I support women's reproductive rights, it's 300 pages of things that you have to understand and those are linked to 300 other pages of things you have to understand. And it's really tough to get in the doorway. Uh, mm -hmm. Gentlemen, a thought just occurred to me. Will there be anything else that we're discussing uh, for the next three months besides the budget uh, from the legislature? Uh, there, oh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the Military Family Act is moving through the legislature. Uh, I suppose that, that we could talk about that. Uh, and picnics in the summer for military families. Bob wins, big bill. Uh, but it's going to be tough to talk about much of anything. I, you know, I think I think you got the uh, the question of um, uh, a, a a bill that resolve that 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 um, may attack the Anchorage Equal Rights Law um, and some other things. But I don't. It's hard to see them getting a lot of traction on issues other than what we're talking about here. And John, you guys have had some great coverage on your site rounding up what was pre-filed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, do you think that most of the attention is going to budget and so these smaller pre-filed bills have sort of been next to the side or, or you're just, what's the calculus there? I, th I think it depends largely on how the budget negotiations go. Uh, you know, again, this is an election year. This is the session that lawmakers would prefer naming post offices and naming bridges and passing resolutions about how much we love this constitutional amendment or not, you know. Um, I, yeah, I think there will be some other issues slash distractions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure, you know, we, last session we devoted the bulk of our time to daylight saving time and, and things of that nature. So hopefully we stick on the budget, you know, as, as unfortunate as that is for me because it's easier to cover a lot of other topics, mm -hmm. but um, S Senator Click Bishop, uh, had a quote that Governor Walker used last night in, in his address, which is this session, the number one issue is the budget, the number two issue is the budget, the number three issue is the budget. Uh, I'm sure that there will be uh, time for, you know, four through 20, um, but... Well, let me, let me jump in and, and say, even, even with the budget and stuff, uh, there are other committees, there has to be something else that's discussed in some mm -hmm. of the other ones, and I want to ask you, I mean, um, the uh, marriage equality issue brought forward by Representative Tellerico of uh, Healy and uh, Senator Machiki of Soldatna. Mm -hmm. um, what is it, and is it important at all? Because I thought this issue was sort of settled for Alaska in 2014. I think it's an interesting approach. Uh, what it is, is it protects clergy uh, from solemnizing a marriage uh, for you know, a same-sex couple. Um, it's Alaska. 
you don't have to be a, a priest or a rabbi or anything like that to, to marry someone. You just have to go down to the courthouse and, and get the papers filed. So this basically says if uh, a member of the clergy or, or anyone else really has a deeply held religious belief that they don't support and mar uh, they don't support marriage equality, they don't have to marry the couple. They also don't have to provide uh, accommodations or services or anything like that. Um, I talked to Senator Michiki uh, for quite a quite a long time. Uh, the, the the day that I, I published the article about it, my concern is number one, um, when we passed the Anchorage ordinance, uh, finally codifying anti-discrimination laws, there was a, a large amount of time spent on religious exemptions uh, because what defines uh, you know a someone who should be exempt. Um, so we developed this whole criteria for, well, are you this much of clergy, or are you uh, in bus ministries, or you know, all, all sorts of terms that, that some places come up with to uh, shelter employees. <laughs> the parking lot shoveling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the karate ministry, that there is one. Um, it, so that is not established in state law. Uh, additionally, we don't have any anti-discrimination uh, laws at the state level. Um, now, Senator Michiki holds uh, that this would only affect the clergy. Um, my contention is I think it could be more broadly interpreted. Uh, people like to try to stretch things, you know, to serve their own purposes. Uh, but my, my main strange takeaway from it is because we don't have an, a statewide anti-discrimination law, and we do have marriage equality now, which is the law of the land, which means you can you know, get married on a Sunday, then if your landlord finds out on a Monday or your employer finds out on, on, on a Tuesday, you can be fired or evicted. Why would the first action that the state takes be to protect clergy? You know, I, there are two bills uh, in, in the legislature right now that are statewide anti-discrimination laws uh, from Representative Andy Josephson, uh, a Democrat, and Kathy Munoz, a Republican from Juneau. Um, my suggestion to Senator Michiki is why not combine his bill with uh, either Josephson or, or uh, Munoz's bill? Um, and he did go as far as to say that if my concerns were accurate uh, in terms of it being used outside of the clergy or expanded for whatever reason, he said he'd vote against his own bill. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, didn't, he, he said he wasn't wholly opposed to uh, looking into the anti-discrimination state law. And Rich, did you have anything to well, add? I mean, we, we laugh about the snowplow uh, ministry, but in fact, uh, it's true. There is, it's true. It's true. So, uh, uh, so, so, how do you get how do you get around that? Uh, you can't you can't have the government deciding who is a journalist, who is a priest, you know, and uh, because then you have the First Amendment issue. So there is that problem. But on the other hand, Machiki make his Machiki makes a point. Well, what I'm trying to do is not so much protect the minister from officiating because uh, it seems like the minister could decide who he wants to officiate for, but uh, or she. But, uh, but to protect a minister against a subpoena of their right. sermon, which happened, which did happen in Houston, Houston Texas. And, uh, and, and, you know, it seems like the First Amendment might also protect that pastor from being subpoenaed. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the final resolution was in Houston. But uh, they they yeah. actually canceled the subpoena. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. Know. It's yeah, like exactly. subpoenaing my, my reporter's notes. Right. You can't do that either you mm -hmm. know, without a lot of effort. So uh, so maybe Machiki's measure is not quite as necessary as do, he thinks it is. I do want to ask with uh, the not abundant <laughs> amount of time that we have left, mm -hmm. uh, are we going to see a capital <laughs> budget? Uh, you got a, you got a, a bond? <laughs> <laughs> Anything. I mean, I'm, I'm just curious yeah. with all the belt tightening or maybe belt Cinching is yeah. a more accurate term for it. You have to have some capital budget because mm. you have to match federal funds unless you want to throw that money away. Uh, so, so you got to have some capital budget, and and there are there are needs in the state that you you know, no matter how bad things are, in any economy, in any recession, any depression, there's always some money being spent. I mean, in the in in the Great Depression in the United States, there were people who were were still, were still working and making money. You you got to have some some kind of construction budget. Walker's proposal is to have a bond, which would be a little different than we've had before. 
but uh, there's, there's, there will be some capital budget. And John, last question to mm -hmm. you is about uh, cannabis and mm -hmm. the state's newest legalized industry. We saw in that sandwich thing that it's likely to be about a pickle's worth of mm -hmm. revenues from that. But, um, <laughs> and more sandwiches. Yeah, is there, is, th <laughs> uh, is there more legislation expected to come out of the legislature, or are we at a point where this is just a local issue? Um, I think it's going to be both. Uh, I know that in Anchorage, the, at the assembly level, there's a, you know there's the own, their own ad hoc committee uh, that's looking at local taxes. I know that uh, Assembly Chair Dick Traney is very um, adamant about making sure that Anchorage is going to see some cash come in from that and hopefully uh, keep it outside of the tax cap. Um, in the legislature, they just had a hearing yesterday with uh, Cynthia Franklin for the uh, now the marijuana board, uh, talking about. Uh, different proposals that isn't sitting well with the the emerging cannabis industry when you're talking about a per ounce tax. Uh, but this is mostly at a financial level of how much are we going to try and capture from marijuana at this point? Yeah, I think really the legislature is probably mostly out of uh, the game in terms of um, regulations. I think it's more on the board. Good now. last note. Uh, and that is all the time that we have here on Alaska Edition. Thank you to both of my guests. Uh, editor Richard Maurer from the Alaska, from Anchorage, uh, Alaska Dispatch News, and John Arano of Alaska Commons, and thank you at home for joining us as well. I'm Zachariah Hughes. If you have questions or comments about the program, you can email Alaska Edition at alaskapublic.org or write us at 3877 University Drive, Anchorage, Alaska 99508. Alaska Edition is a production of KAKM. The opinions expressed are those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily represent those of KSKA, KAKM, the licensee, or their underwriter.